The Arctic is one of the most forbidding territories on the Earth. Looking in any direction, you get the feeling that man does not belong on this icy rim of the world. The evidence is all around. The vastness, the emptiness, the loneliness, the glow of unnatural colors, the extremes of soundlessness. Soundlessness that fills the intervals between screaming winds, winds that can whip snow into drifts higher than a barn in minutes. For about three months in the Arctic winter, the sun does not rise. And for four months in the summer, it does not set. Temperatures rise to only some 65 degrees in that brief summer moment, and dip to 65 degrees below zero for seemingly an endless winter. But startling as it may be, men have been living in the Arctic, fighting the cold, the winds, the darkness for thousands of years. And now to guard us against possible attack over the pole, modern men, men from cities like Dallas and Atlanta, men from states like Oregon and New York, men from Denmark and the United States have learned also to live in the Arctic. They have moved in to build, maintain, and operate the most spectacular warning systems in the world. Warning systems that will track the paths of intercontinental ballistic missiles and the flights of manned bombers. Among the electronic eyes of the North that never close are the great radars of the ballistic missile early warning system, called BMUs. This system is maintained by Radio Corporation of America through Air Force contract. Each big detection radar of BMUs is larger than a football field standing on its side. And the tracking antenna is housed in a protective radome 140 feet in diameter. The complete installation is as tall as a 15-story building. These radars are among the greatest construction feats in history. And they can detect an object as small as a house door at a range of 1,500 nautical miles. This is roughly the distance from Washington, D.C. to El Paso, Texas. The BMU's radars send out carefully calibrated beams of pulsed radar energy at two elevations above the Earth. These form two horizontal detection fans, one above the other. If a missile passes through the lower fan, radar pulses bounce back from it and its position is detected. Seconds later, the missile will pass through the upper fan. From these two points, track, velocity, and impact area are instantly and automatically figured by the BMU's electronic computers. Their electronic memory systems store recollections of every missile, spacecraft, or piece of satellite debris that has come within its range. There are three BMUs sites. The Thule Greenland site is linked with one in Filingdales Moor, England, and another in Clear, Alaska. The BMUs site at Clear, Alaska is in an isolated area northeast of Mount McKinley. This site provides the detection capability for the west side of the United States and Canada, overlapping the edge of the radar originating from Thule, Greenland. The Thule site is on the very edge of the treacherous Greenland ice cap. And the site at Filingdales is over 200 miles north of London, England, in a location that completes the northward coverage for ICBM over the North Pole and extends southeast detection down through Europe against a mid-continental missile attack. It also overlaps the west edge of the Thule BMUs radar. BMUs is fine for detecting missiles, but not for detecting bombers. Bombers can fly in undetected beneath the BMU's radar fan. But bombers can't get by the dew line undetected. 
2 stands for Distant Early Warning Line. The radars of the Dew Line are designed for low and high level air traffic surveillance. They are operated and maintained by the Federal Electric Corporation through contract with the United States Air Force. They are strategically placed along the Arctic Circle so that no bomber on an Arctic route can fly under, around, or over their search patterns. From Alaska, across the barren wilderness of the north, through Canada, and over the 10,000 foot thick ice cap of Greenland, more than 30 dew line sites form a fence of electronic eyes 5,000 miles long. On the eastern end, it is tied into the surveillance systems of our NATO allies, through Iceland to Norway. No matter how isolated the site, no matter how long the Arctic days and nights around it, no matter how terrible the cold, every site of the Dew and Bemu systems is a place where men must live, work, and survive under some of the strangest conditions in the world. On the Greenland ice cap, some dew line buildings have to be jacked up as much as 10 feet a year to keep them above snow. The feet of the buildings are already 65 feet under snow, and yet each year, six more feet of snow pile up, and the buildings have to be jacked up again and again. The buildings are five stories above the level of the snow, so that the cold air can circulate underneath them. If there were no cold air space underneath, the building would melt the ice beneath it with its own heat and quickly disappear into the ice cap. Where buildings are built on permafrost, the bottom of the buildings have to be air conditioned to keep the heat from melting the permafrost. In a land where the wind can jump from 15 to 150 miles per hour in a few minutes, no man is safe. Wherever men travel, there are emergency huts by the roadside called phase shacks. These huts have a telephone, emergency food rations, and a gas stove. When a man must go out in a severe Arctic storm, he must take a buddy with him. No man goes out alone then. The wing command post has declared Thule Air Base to be in a phase three condition. All personnel must be accounted for immediately. If you have been ordered to remain on duty, report your location to your barracks chief immediately. Thule Air Base is now in a phase three condition. The alert is also given in Danish. This means that exposed flesh will freeze in 60 seconds. What kind of protection does this demand? First, thermal underwear, double socks, and regular clothes. On top of that, mutlucks, quilted pants, mittens, parkas, and face mask. If a man omits any of these articles of clothing under these weather conditions, the Arctic winter in seconds can cripple or kill him. Survival is an iron discipline, one mistake and a man dies. Doorknobs are plastic covered. Metal on a doorknob would freeze to the flesh of a man's hand. Under the worst conditions, if the power failed at some sites, even the men in the building could be frozen solid in 45 minutes. 99% of the time, there is no place to go except into the next room. The men fight boredom as well as the cold. Maintenance men become amateur carpenters. Mechanics become sound experts. Electricians become lapidarists, polishing semi-precious stones. And some men even raise tropical fish, or try to. But the principal work is watching the sky toward the North Pole. Data, this is Council here. Roger, Data here. Yes, Data, could I have an indication of the last track I sent in, please? Uh, Roger, that track is unknown at the moment. Uh, continue five minute cycle tells on it. Thank you, Data, this is Council out. Roger, Data. This constant watch is kept at places called Saglek, Melville at Goose Bay, Pingersuit Mountain, Cape Dyer. 
but Arctic harbors are frozen solid for nine months out of the year. Only in the summer can the Coast Guard and the Navy keep them open with icebreakers. On the voyage north, the vessels break through the ice pack and pass 200 and 300 foot icebergs. Structural damage to reinforced hulls is common. Sometimes the ice pack will close upon a ship. During whaling days, many ships were trapped in the ice and crushed by tremendous pressure. In three short months, ships of the United States Military Sea Transport Service must deliver most of the supplies for an entire year. The Army's 264th Transportation Company from Fort Eustis, Virginia, supplies stevedore support for the unloading operation at Thule. Beginning in July, approximately 200 men spend three months unloading vessels that supply Thule Air Base and other sites with everything from tea bags to 50-ton cranes. Every site has to be supplied with everything, eggs, antennas, and mail. Airlift must be used for the more remote sites. Aircraft operate from all types of landing surfaces. At Hoffman Naval Air Station, Iceland, a Navy C-47 must land on a gravel beach. Mail and supplies are then loaded on a fishing boat. 